Yeah, so I'm really interested in the the royal and sort of state relationship historically to Vodou. Many of the kings uh, of the coastal regions practiced Vodou, and they perpetuated a kind of practice whereby, or the communities of those kings mm. perpetuated a practice where they raised the ancestor, and the ancestor became a spirit. But it seems to be connected to the royalty. Mm. So is this still a part of, of uh, Yoruba religion? Is there a relationship between pol politics and religion? Or has this been, through colonialism, sort of bleached away from mm. the religion? I can't really answer that. I mean, what you're telling me is new to me, so I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to, you know, to take that and try to explore it a little bit more. Um, I mean, as I understand it, well, I wouldn't just say within Yoruba, but within most ethnic groups in Nigeria, the, um, the traditional rulers, the traditional chiefs, are still very powerful and very strong. They operate in different ways. For example, um, in Calabari, they, 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 never had, they, they, they were never empires like Yoruba or Benin or Hausa. The city and the Igbos, Igbos and Calabaris or city states, and they operated in a very much more egalitarian um, manner, um, uh, system of, of of governance than, say, in the empires of Benin and Yoruba and Afon and the, the Homi um, empires and um, Hausa. So, the power of the paramount chiefs in Yoruba are still very strong. Um, how much of that power and how much is related to the practice of Yoruba religion, I am not sure. But mm. it's definitely something I think worth investigating mm. as you've brought it up and mm. I will look into that. Um, I I don't really know, so I, I don't want to kind of make any suppositions. Mm -hmm. but I think it's a, it's a it's an interesting question as to whether at that point um, the relationship between Yoruba religion is very strong, or whether that too has been Christianized, mm. and how much influence Christianity has had on the way the paramount chiefs of Yoruba, the various chiefs of Yoruba. Um, and Benin, for example, how 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 the and and in the how they how they rule mm. and the kind of governance that takes place. I mean, within within the structure of modern governance, it's the Nigerian government has to recognise the authority of the traditional chiefs. Mm -hmm. But this differs according to what is seen as the power. For example, at this moment, just to, to a little sidebar, the um, you know I, I I'm sure you know the Biafran war in Nigeria, the Igbo, the secession 1967 Biafran war, which took place for three years. There was a civil war. In Nigeria, when the Igbos, together with other pe other um, ethnicities in in what is now the Niger Delta, seceded from the Nigerian government, and there was a civil war that lasted three years. Okay. Um, and it was at the end of it, there were millions that died, and starvation, and it was very brutal, very very brutal indeed. So over the years, really, just to cut the story short, it's never really been resolved. Um, just recently, in the last couple of years, there has been a kind of resurgence of a group, um, the movement for the, uh, I think it's the survival of the Igbo people, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but 
uh, a movement to secede, basically, mm -hmm. um, has been growing amongst the Igbo people. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there has been uh, movements for self-determination in the Niger Delta amongst all the ethnicities. And I, I've actually written about that in the context of um, violence against women. Mm -hmm. um, so very recently, one of the leaders of Mossob um, was who had been um, conducting a number of very anti-Nigerian um, broadcasts on radio, uh, in, uh, internet radio, mm -hmm. was arrested. Nandi Kano was arrested um, in Lagos. So the present government of Nigeria is um, um, Buhari, and Buhari is a Muslim from, from the north. Mm -hmm. So there is this tension that is going on between the east, the southeast, the Niger Delta, and the, the north, and to some extent the west, which is essentially the Yoruba. And what, what has happened was following the arrest of Namdi Kano, the paramount chiefs, some paramount chiefs of Igbo land have made a, a, a delegation to the president to protest about the marginalization of the Igbo people. So I say that just to give you some idea of the, the kind of power relations that, so rather than, it's not the governor, the elected governors of the Igbo states that is making this delegation to the, the president, it is the paramount chiefs who are the, I would say, the, the keepers of the language, the culture, traditions, and so on. Mm. So that kind of gives you an idea of that relationship. So they will have to be heard, whether they are listened to, but they will have to be heard. Mm -hmm. And that would be the same if it was the Yoruba um, paramount chiefs or the Calabari paramount chiefs, but it's also to do with numbers as well. Mm. Um, so the smaller ethnic groups may not have that same power mm. um, as, as say, Igbo or, or Yoruba. Right, which are, which are nations within which are, a nation. Which are, which are, exactly, like millions. nations. I mean, yeah, there's millions. like 20 million Yoruba, right? Yeah, no, no, more, or I think more. it's about 40. 40 million, yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, within the whole of greater Yoruba, I would say there's there's more than twenty. I mean, there's in Nigeria, there's 170 million, million people in right, the country. So right, right, right. you know, um, the three um, biggest ethnic groups are Yoruba, Hausa, and Igbo, mm. and then um, various others, and then very small people like Calabari people, and and so on. Or even the Ajor, they number about twelve million, which is quite a small minority. Um, and that's pretty much covers um, at least 50% of the Niger Delta, and mm. Calabari comes under a jaw. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's something worth looking at, is how how indigenous belief systems, how, how they fit into the modern um, um, chieftaincy, traditional rulers, mm. um, what they follow and what they don't follow especially in those large kingdoms like Benin and Yoruba, mm. which have a, they have a lot of power. Mm. Having said that, they have been challenged even by their own people, you know, at various points in history. So, you know, even, even those ones that have that power, you know, it's not kind of total. <laughs> right. Know? Right. Well, you can use the religious mythology to uh, enhance your appearance of power, mm. but you can be deposed any way uh, in the process. So now what about the Muslim regions of Nigeria? You know, looking at Nigeria from a distance, we read a lot, of course, about Boko Haram, mm -hmm. and we know a little bit about the Hausa population, which is uh, right mostly Muslim. Mm -hmm. But uh, we also know, looking at different parts of uh, Muslim uh, Africa, West Africa, that uh, forms of Voodoo or African traditional uh, religions with basically spirit orientations mm -hmm. have been uh, included in some parts of uh, West Africa where you have this kind of coexistence and people will go to the mosque on Friday but 
you know, they go to a traditional a healer another day, mm. and uh, they'll interact with spirits through that person. Mm. And so there's kind of simultaneous practice mm. of different religions traditionally, mm. including in the Muslim regions, mm. or maybe you could say especially there. So, so, mm. so what's you know what's mm. the tension there? Is is the his, is you know sort of African religion finished in the regions where Boko Haram is uh, uh, you know working? Mm. Or what is the sort of prospect mm. that you would estimate for the future of African religions in the current mm. in the current tense situation? Mm. I think, I mean, yes, you're absolutely right, and that just takes place without, throughout, I, I speak for Nigeria, where, you know, despite the presence of the, the strong presence and influence of the evangelical fundamentalist um, Christian movement, that people still seek out um, traditional healers um, for certain ailments. and including Muslims, um, will seek out marabouts either to, 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 for their, to tell them their future or, you know, to tell them what to do with a particular situation. And um, I'm not sure how open it is, but I know personally of people that do seek out the marabout for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, before they do anything, they, they seek the advice of the marabout, which, it, it, really is an imam mm. um, mm -hmm. so the person may not necessarily justi may justify it in the fact that well I'm speaking to an imam but you know it, it, you're speaking about things that are not in the Quran because you're asking the imam to tell you your future and should you do this or that or whatever mm. and what should you do with this situation mm. so that takes place in Islam and it takes place in lots of other different um, within Christianity and so on is that they live side by side and I think it's the same in, in Haiti as well is that you know people um, go to see a traditional healer which you know w w what are you seeking from the traditional healer is you know um, plants that will cure your illness as opposed to taking a chemical tablet that you know so it's not something as it's made out to be some kind of evil witchcraft, mm. it is it is healing, mm. which you know even in in the West now people are seeking out to to use various kind of plants, um, and herbs for healing instead of um, chemicals mm -hmm. uh, type of thing. But I think the 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 future, to me, the tension lies really between um, the. The Christ, not even yeah, I would say the Christian, the the fundamentalist Christian religions, and um, their influence and inf influence within government, and within traditional uh, belief systems, and I, as I said earlier, just listening to one or Sean Priest, I, I, I think it's. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say I don't hold much hope, but I think it's a big struggle mm. to 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 maintain those um, those beliefs and more and more people because people do do mix the two they they mix the two, but it's becoming more and more um, difficult because of peer pressure and um, you know if you want to get a job or you want to do this or that you know you're you're questioned about your, what what church you go to mm. uh, or what religion you are mm. so those tensions become even greater under that you know in, in that um, circumstance um, as far as Boko Haram is concerned I can't really say much about how that relates to local belief systems in the north um, I can't say at all because there's so much to say about Boko Haram and I it's it's just um, I can't answer that question yeah. I, don't really, I don't really know how it fits in I mean right. you know people have stories about it but I, you know I don't know 
you know how how it works. Right. Yeah. yeah and then of course, the, those regions that are suffering from conflict are very difficult to visit. I mean, the yeah. Even for Nigerian yeah. security. Uh, well, absolutely. Personnel. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're I the mean, main targets actually, but. Well, this is the thing. I mean, the interesting thing about it is, you know, despite you know what you you hear in the West, the majority of people being killed, um, and whose lives are disrupted and property is 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 destroyed, by whether it's Boko Haram or ISIS, are Muslims. Mm -hmm. They are not non-Muslims. For sure. Um, mm -hmm. And people seem to, uh, you know, forget that. And mm -hmm. I mean, just recently. I think it, it was just today I read that another group of um, girls were kidnapped mm. um, by Boko Haram mm. somewhere in the north. I just saw it on Twitter, so I, I didn't actually get the detail. So that is just ongoing, and you know mm. it's kind of ridiculous for the government to say, oh, "Well, we're not going to be able to destroy Boko Haram before Christmas." I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, they said that before. I mean, nobody believes that. But it's it just mm. goes to show how well not even inept but how powerless to some degree governments are when they're faced with groups like ISIS and which and Boko Haram which are huge in the in the scheme of how many Muslims inhabit this world they are such a minus zero point zero percent of people mm -hmm. um, but even despite that the response particularly in the west but not only in the west even in nigeria is to um hold all muslims responsible yes um for whatever um crimes have been committed by a small number of people which you know yeah yeah that is definitely happening at uh, a very frightening speed right now yes well, if we look at our presidential campaign well, I'd like to take a moment to turn to the situation of, uh, you know, gays and lesbians within Vodou. So, there is a documentary called Of Men and Gods. I don't know if you've seen mm. it. You, you have. Yes, yeah. Which is a very interesting mm. uh, look at a subculture within Vodou mm. where uh, mostly gay men are able to find solidarity and mm. friendship and uh, spiritual um, benefits mm. by a, a kind of practice in Vodou and, and by watching it you get some impressions about the s sort of spaces available to mm. members of the gay community. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, to give you another uh, mm. example, uh, so that, that's an example of Vodou's seeming openness mm. to mm. members of the, the gay community. Uh, and you also get this impression in various ceremonies in South Florida and in Haiti. You can you can estimate maybe there's some gay um, initiates mm. and they're you know fully welcomed mm. and uh, in fact they might be leaders in terms of dancing and singing and mm. so you hear things from people about their value and importance mm. as really inspired mm. leaders. Uh, but then, on the other hand, I've met uh, priests who have told me frankly that they will not initiate uh, members of the gay community and, and that uh, they will refer such individuals to other communities mm. where they would receive a better mm. welcome. Mm. So, it, and it sort of makes sense, it's a case-by-case -case type of mm. thing. You have, right, circles of openness and circles of uh, closeness or mm. prejudice. So. Mm. Is this unique to Haiti, or is Nigerian uh, your Yoruba religion mm. also a space where you can find this this complexity, mm. where there are members, uh, there are members of the mm. gay community who are fully welcomed and integrated into religious mm. life, and others where they're excluded? Mm. Uh, what, can you give us uh, any sense of that? Not really, because I don't know the Yoruba um, well enough. But what I would say is that what I have, what I have found, and, and this is you know through friends um, from various parts of the continent, is that it's it's there's so many contradictions, um, and and it's 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 very complex, because you find that you know you take a country like Uganda or Nigeria, for example where there are horrendous 
anti-homosexuality laws and punishments. Um, and even in other countries, uh, Malawi, Zambia, you know, across the board, apart from a few one or two interestingly francophone countries where um, homosexuality has never been illegal. Um, and then those countries that were formerly British colonies where it has always been um, illegal. But within that, you know, on, the, on a family to family basis, people react in different ways, even in countries where you think are extremely homophobic, like Jamaica. Mm. You know, it's it's so there's a the, there's the, the the social and community aspect. There's a legislative aspect, but then there's a family aspect, and you know, in certain spaces, um, people exist and they're as as family members, and you will hear stories, you know, where they say, well, you know, so you know, there's this couple here, and there's that couple here. And they've lived in the village, and they've lived, you know. We all know that they're gay, mm. and and so on. But I, you know, so these are kind of anecdotal. I realise, but when you take them as as a whole, they become more than anecdotal. So there's that social pressure, and then there's, as I said, there's a there's a legislative pressure. Um, so I cannot speak for Yoruba because I don't know it that well, but within the context of Haiti, I think it's also complex because it's not something, though you can go to any, you know, um, ceremony and, you know, see people who are, you know, out, gay, lesbian, trans um, individuals, and, you know, there are some... Um, Peristyles, which are have more LGBT people, including the Hugan and Mambos, mm -hmm. than than the non. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. you 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 have that situation, but at the same time, outside of a ceremony, the the embrace embracing of LGBT people may not necessarily be to the same level as within. A particular in a, in a ceremonial space mm. so that I mean I think I understand that and yes I too have heard some you know Hugan who said that uh, well one Hugan told me that well he doesn't have any problem with LGBT people but he's not going to that he wouldn't um, initiate okay yeah well. so um, and so yes I've heard that too but mm. then others um, I know Mambos that are and who who are, um, you know, gay or lesbian, may not necessarily identify in that in those Western, under those Western identities, mm -hmm. but they are open, openly involved in same that same sex desire, whether you know with a partner or not. That that's who they are. Um, they don't necessarily name themselves in that way, and I think that's also. Um, an issue is, is how you name yourself. So um, I think it's quite complex. And I think that's even, you know, in terms of gender as well and how um, women are perceived within uh, voodoo. Um, the whole... Because I think, you know, if, if you're working as a mambo, how is that relationship the same as when you are in the community as as not a mambo? Mm. You know, well, you're still a mambo, but you know, within your household or your family, is it the same? You know, that relationship does it have the same power dynamics mm. as when you or uh, I'm going to see a mambo to seek out some um, traditional healing or something, or you know, a man is going to see a mambo and seek out that power dynamics. Is that the same as if it would be in the domestic sphere or in the social context of going to the bank or going to school? Those mm. are the, those have to be looked at. And I don't think, I think that's one of the areas that um, Lexi and I wanted to, to look at, mm. whether, you know, those relation power dynamics were replicated outside of the ceremonial space because mm. I think the ceremonial space is a ceremonial space and I think that that's a very powerful space mm -hmm. and what takes place there 
to me personally is it might be moment a moment in time and mm -hmm. when I say moment I don't literally mean an hour or whatever I mean but they are they are moments in time mm -hmm. where something is happening in that space that does not necessarily take place outside and that's irrespective of your gender your sexual orientation mm -hmm. your race or, or any other arbitrary human um, construct Mm. what's happening there is 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 quite different mm. so we can't always take that and say that that's what it is outside even right. within Fudu even within Alaku that is historically been there for three four hundred years mm. and that's what people practice so I think one has to mm. to understand the ceremonial space the living as a way of life space and then the rest of the social spaces and economic spaces in which people exist and mm. I think if we're looking at LGBT we need to look at it in that context as well right yeah yeah so uh, you're, you're right and, and there is a obviously a profound investment in spirituality within the ceremonial context that allows people to become distanced from as you say all of their personal identity attributes mm. and so yeah that that is that does add a degree of complexity yeah. but that reflects reality so mm -hmm. what what about your projects tell us a bit uh, we've spoken at some length mm. already but could you look to the future and tell us about where what type of projects you would like to do? You've alluded to a research project. Mm. Uh, are you interested in writing articles? You mentioned your work as a journalist. Mm. Are you interested in writing shorter articles to address misunderstandings mm. to a broader audience? Are you also interested in developing specialist writings that look uh, at very um, sort of microscopic aspects of the mm. religion? Or, or a memoir, what uh, can we hope from you? <laughs> not, a, not a memoir, I think no? that would just be too much. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm interested in looking at things, in, I mean, on a personal level, I'm interested in, as I said, looking, looking at Haitian voodoo, but I'm, I'm now looking at how I can get back home to, to look at, you know, my own kind of spiritual heritage within within if possible within Calabari which is even more difficult because it's just practically you know non-existent and to, to search it out is very difficult so even within you know going to to look at Yoruba so I'm interested in that and I'm still interested in these um, investigating or interrogating the connections between Haitian voodoo and Yoruba in particular only because I would like to do more but you know that in itself is a huge huge massive task mm -hmm. so I'm interested in doing that I'm also interested in you know I think more kind of um, photo documentary and um, the visual um, because and I, I think it's it's just really it's it's really part of writing a different narrative about Haiti, and moving away and 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 challenging the victim poverty and um, dependency narrative that has been built around Haiti, which you know has just gotten worse and worse since the earthquake that did not start with the earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a political project as much as anything else. And I think that for me personally, um, making that narrative through looking at voodoo, which is very much, from my perspective, part of Haiti, but it is also very much part of the African heritage. And, you know, I keep going back to, 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 um, the Atlantic crossing and and all of that so it's it's making those documentaries whether through through some text I, um, I, I do write a lot but I have not published what I've written but I'm 
because I guess I'm re really focusing on the visual, but I would like to look more at the, for example, um, LG, the queer LGBTIQ um, aspect within within voodoo and how um, that kind of that how that encounters with the the obvious decolonization process and resistance and survival of this belief system mm. and also looking at gender as well so it incorporates quite a, a number of areas and I I mean at the moment I've really been looking at ceremonial spaces so I just started last time I was in Haiti in August to kind of look outside of the ceremonial space so what I would like to do is look outside and more into the social space spaces and yeah to look at the specifics and also to to possibly look at smaller how to look at it from an ancestral spirit uh, spirituality outside of the because my focus really has been around just two lakus, uh, Sukri and, and Bajo, mm -hmm. and you know a few other small um, Paris deals in Port-au-Prince. So what I would like to, and societies as well in, in Gonaive. So what I would like to do would be to uh, move away from that and look at some more rural communities in a more, as you put it, microscopic way, but look at the social aspect as well as the spiritual Mm. and ancestral aspect but always within looking at it from a historical point of view of surviving and resistance because I think that's very very important because it, I look at it in, in, in for example in the context of the anti-blackness and the way how Haiti apart from the fact that it was the first independent country outside of in in in, in the so-called West, but um, a former slave um, economy, which in itself is very powerful and very mean of meaningful within our history as African people. Mm -hmm. I think that has to be said. So that's one thing. But there's also in the context of the whole anti-blackness, and I think Haiti to some degree represents that mm -hmm. in a very in a, in a kind of nation space. Um, way which other uh, black countries don't necessarily um, speak to because of the independence, because of the slave revolution mm -hmm. and declaration of independence, and even be because you know to be Haitian is to be black. You know, I think that's a powerful statement in itself. Mm -hmm. You know, irrespective of what your color is, because mm -hmm. that kind of challenges the whole notion of race, which we know is a con construct anyway. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's important to look at, always look at it in that, through that lens of resistance and survival and how, why is it that, that the West is so invested in undermining a certain belief system mm. and undermining a certain people who happen to declare independence over the nation of France which at that time was probably one of the most powerful nations and why why is the West so invested in maintaining the subjugation of these people so as long as voodoo exists as long as the Laku exists as long as all those systems that are associated with that exist in terms of the Afri Africa and the diaspor diaspora, I think that's a very important statement. And that's why I think for me personally, it's important to look at, not because I'm not Haitian, but it's important as, as an African and really as an African that's in the diaspora for mm -hmm. the essential purposes. That's why I've been um, for most of my adult life. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at it from that perspective. Mm. I don't know if that kind of makes sense. It yeah. makes a lot of yeah. sense. Well, I, I would like to take a moment to thank you for your willingness to come to Gainesville and to share your thoughts with the uh, audience that will be uh, enjoying this interview. 
and so uh, in the name of the Vodou Archive, which is an NEH-funded project, I, I would like to thank you for your generous uh, sharing and your, your generous time today. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Appreciate thank it. you very much for wanting to interview me and to, for giving me this opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Okay. Great having you.